اوكي بسم الله قال المصنف رحمه الله ونفعنا بعلومه في الدارين امين This is section 6 on page 354 the hadith of the prophet's will عليه الصلاه والسلام People might ask taking into consideration the truth of the prophet's protection عليه الصلاه والسلام as far as his words are concerned is confirmed in all of his states and it is not sound for there to be any contradiction or confusion in them, whether they are by intention or inadvertent, in health or sickness, in seriousness or in jest, pleasure or anger, about the meaning of the following hadith regarding his will, which is found in uh, Bukhari and Muslim. Ibn Abbas anhu said, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was near death, some men were in the room and the Prophet said to them, come, I will write a document for you so you will not be misguided after it. One of them, Umar said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is overcome by pain. One variant has come to me and I will write a letter for you so that you will never be misguided after me. They disagreed and said, what is wrong with him? Is he delirious? They asked him about it and then he said, leave me, I am better as I am. One of the variants says that the Prophet ﷺ is delirious. One variant has Hajara, Yahjuru in the first version, or Hajara in the second, is also related as Al Hujru and Al Hujra. There are different readings of that same verb. Umar what is the meaning of this Hujra and Hujr meaning? What is the meaning? What do we mean by Hujra? Hujr. So, let me get the actual text. This is an important uh, hadith because this is a hadith that the Shia use to criticize um, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. So, Okay, let the it's a little complicated. Let, let me just continue reading because he's going to, in a couple of paragraphs, explain the word. So let me let me when I, and I'll comment on the word when we come. Omar said that the Prophet is in great pain, and we have the book of Allah, which is enough for us. There is a lot of argument, and the Prophet said, Sahan, get away from me. So the um the Shia, I mean, it's not meant to be a polemic class, but it's, this is very important because the Shia will say, you see, Omar radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Omar radiallahu anhu ruined, ruined the, the Khilafah because the Prophet والسلام, was going to tell, you know, write in his wasiyah uh, that Imam Ali alayhi salam was going to be uh, the next Khalifa. And look what Omar did radiallahu anhu, right? That's, that's a common... Um, uh, statement of the Shia, which, you know, with all due respect, I mean, is a is a massive problem because it 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 
it is ultimately criticizing the Prophet, والسلام, not Sayyidina Umar. Maybe the Prophet could not control, or if the Prophet had to say something that was important uh, related to the message, all of the things that we've read, like for the last two years in this book, we, we learned that the Prophet والسلام, uh, has to be able to give the message uh, accurately, completely. He didn't leave anything out. So that, that interpretation, um, like many of the um, many of the interpretations offered by the Shia on some critical matters provides there's there's an incoherence in that interpretation. Anyway, um, let me continue reading, and inshallah, in in about five seven minutes, it'll be clear. One version of the uh, of the hadith said that the, the people of the house disagreed and argued. And some said, go near so that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi can write a document for you. Others said what Umar said. The Imam said concerning this hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi were not protected from illness and the resulting great pain, unconsciousness, and other physical effects. They are protected in the course of any illness from any words which might detract from their miracle or lead to the disruption of their sharias through delirium and disturbance. So, it meaning the Prophet ﷺ got sick, or could get sick like anybody else, but in that sickness he is protected from saying or doing anything that would, would mess up the, the delivering of the message. In addition to, I don't know if you remember, but when we talked about the physical body of the Prophet ﷺ, we also said that he's, he's physically much stronger than the average person. On this basis, those who transmit the verb in the hadith as hajara, meaning he is delirious, are not correct. When someone is delirious, one says hajara, hujran. And when someone speaks in an unseemly manner, one says ahjara, hujran. Ahjara is transitive of hajara. The soundest and most fitting reading of this hadith is, is he not delirious? When the, with the sense of negation on the part of the one who thought that he should not write a document. This is how it is in the Sahih collection of Bukhari and in the transmission of all the transmitters of the version of the hadith from a Zuhri. It is also in the version of the hadith from Muhammad ibn Salam, Salam from Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Usayli, Usayli has it like that in his edition of Al-Bukhari. It is like that elsewhere. It is also related that from Muslim in the version of the hadith from Sufyan and others. The variant of Hajran, he is delirious, can be taken as having the interrogative particle elided. I don't know what that means. So it really, oh, so it really is a Hajra. Is he deli delirious? So basically, what he's focused on here is not responding to the Shia um, commentary. He here is responding to the incorrect interpretation of the hadith saying that the Prophet ﷺ was delirious. He, because basically he's saying he can't, that, that's an impossibility for Rasulullah ﷺ. So therefore, when you collect all of the hadith, the sound transmission of the hadith is is he not delirious with the negation as for the other and and obviously in the in the translation into english a lot of this gets lost in the other narration hajaran it is a hajaran is he delirious? Like that. Or it could be taken to express the astonishment and bewilderment at the gravity of the Prophet's condition, والسلام, and the severity of his pain, a state which caused the people to be in disagreement about the command to write something down, all of which might cause the speaker to be unaware of what was said. It could be read as hujra, unclear speech due to the intensity of the pain. It was not because their because the relator believed that the Prophet was allowed to speak irrationally. Com compassion could have been 
compassion could have moved them to guard him. Although Allah Ta'ala says, Allah will protect you from the people. Wallahu yaqsimu ka minan nas. One version has a hujran. Is it delirious talk? Which is the transmission of Abu Ishaq al-Mustamli in the Sahih and the version of the Hadith from Ibn Jubair, from Ibn Abbas in the transmission of Qutaybah. This could refer to the disputants. That is, have you come with your disputes to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So there is hujr and object and objectionable words in his presence. Hujr means unseemly words. The ulama disagree about the meaning of this hadith. How could the companions dispute after he had commanded them to bring him something to write on? And this is sort of getting into what the Shia accuse in this hadith, some of the Shia. One of the ulama has said that the obligatory nature of the commands of the Prophet ﷺ were understood in this context to only be either recommended or allowed. Perhaps the context of his words was such that they understood it not to be a direct order. Rather, it was a matter which was left to their choice. Some of them did not understand that and said, ask him about it. When they disagreed, he withdrew from it since it was not a firm order and since they agreed with the opinion of Omar, what Omar had expressed. The ulama say that Omar might have forbidden them to obey him due to his compassion for the Prophet ﷺ because it would be a burden on him to indicate the letter and would have caused him hardship. He said the Prophet ﷺ is in very great pain. By the way, it's also important what we're reading to remind ourselves of the hadith itself. So not all of the hadith are a verbatim narration of what the Prophet ﷺ, but a narration of what the companion heard the Prophet ﷺ say. So why do we have these different variants of the hadith? Because some companions or some narrators narrate bil ma'na, by the meaning. And therefore, in the critique of the hadith, we have a, um, it, it's a very intense science of the critique of the text of the hadith. There are some hadith, the like mutawatir hadith, that are risen to the level that we, you know, this is as close to verbatim as we have. That the Prophet ﷺ himself said, لا ضرر ولا درار. You know, there's no harming or causing harm. But in these hadith, remember this is the narration of the companion, the companions. So, Sometimes the co another companion will hear something. That's what I thought I heard. It's an approximation of what the Prophet ﷺ said. And this is very important because it helps us reconcile many potential differences. Um, like the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, <clears throat> do not hit another person's face. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it in his likeness. Now, the problem with that narration of the hadith is it could lead you to say that we are created in the image of God, which is a Judeo-Christian concept. But that's actually not our concept. In the other versions of the hadith, it's... It's something like, do not strike a person's face because Allah created Adam on its likeness. Meaning that our face is based on the likeness of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. Meaning we are his descendants. That's one interpretation. Or another interpretation is that the person heard the hadith and narrated based on what he also heard the people of the book Ahlul Kitab say about a, a sort of a similar statement. So this narration by meaning, you can narrate verbatimly or narrate by meaning. So one of the jobs of the Hadith scholars is to enter into that very deep level of analysis of the text. Is, is this Hadith narrated verbatim or is it narrated by meaning? Okay, let me come back to the text. <clears throat> It is said that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu feared that he would write down commands that they would be unable to carry out and that they would be forced into wrong action through opposition. 
He thought that the most compassionate thing for the community regarding these matters would be the use of ijtihad, judgment arrived at through investigation and seeking the correct solution for the one who is right in his ijtihad is rewarded and the one who errs is also rewarded. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu knew that the sharia was confirmed and the deen established and that Allah Ta'ala has said today I have perfected your deen for you. And the Prophet Sallallahu had said, I am leaving you the book of Allah and my family. Umar said the book of Allah is enough for us to refute those who are arguing for him and not to refute the Prophet's command. It is said that Sayyidina Umar feared that the hypocrites feared that the hypocrites and those who had sickness in their hearts would make use of it and cause trouble since the document would be written in seclusion, which would enable them to invent false statements about it, as did the Rafidites and others. <clears throat> That's the, the Shia component. It is said that the Prophet Sassim offered to write something down for the purpose of counsel and advice. Did they agree on that or differ? When they differed, he left it. Another group have said that the Hadith means that the Prophet Sassim has answered something he had been asked with regard to this document. He did not initiate the command to write something down, but some of his companions had asked him for it, and he was replying to the request. Others objected to that for this reason, uh, for, for reasons that we have already mentioned. A proof is, in, is found in a similar si story when Al Abbas السلام, said to Imam Ali السلام, come along with us to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa If there is any command for us, we will know it. Imam Ali السلام, disliked that and saying, by Allah, I will not do it. And this is another famous uh, hadith in which Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet والسلام, during the time of the sickness of Rasulullah والسلام, told Imam Ali that let's go ask him yani, if you are meant to be the Khalifa. Because there was Imam Ali والسلام, definitely felt that he should be the Khalifa. Uh, I mean, he said that clearly. And we don't deny that, you know, he, he felt that. Um, and then in this, but the important thing about this hadith is that there are other narrations of the hadith in which Imam Ali rejected Al Abbas's uh, 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 request. And he said, because if the Prophet does not give me the khilafah, then we will never have the khilafah. In other words, if now this critical time he says no, it's like it's Abu Bakr for example, then uh, they'll never come to us. It'll never come to the family of the Prophet And that's, if when you read, I mean, you're not going to find it in this book, but when you read in the history, um, like a Tabari and stuff, you'll find those narrations. I mean, it's in the books of Hadith. It's, it's in the Muslim of Imam Ahmed. Another proof is found in the words of the Prophet leave me, I am better uh, as I am. That is the situation I am now isn't better than giving the command. I leave you with the book of Allah if you leave what you have asked me for. It is mentioned that what was sought was for him to write down who would be the Khalifa after him and that he specifically and, and that he specify who it should be. Okay, so the upshot, I mean, I, I, maybe I spent a little bit too much time on this section, but the upshot of this is the following. Number one is it's important to pay attention that different, that there are the situations and Incidents from the time of the Prophet can be narrated in different ways, either verbatimly or by meaning. And that is one of the reasons why we have different narrations about the same topic. Number two is for us to be able to understand a particular situation, especially if we feel that there's a potential for, for misunderstanding, we have to gather all of the traditions, all of the variants of those of that in all of the narrations of that hadith and put them together. And then number three, as he did you know, very well is to say, okay, well, this verbiage is problematic, of course, but then this verbiage is very clear. It's the, it's the narration of the hadith in the negation. So the first this half of his discussion is we want to negate any, any assumption that the Prophet ﷺ became delirious and said something outside of his control. That's an impossibility for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet does not speak from his own nafs. Indeed, it is revelation. 
another uh, when Abdullah, uh, the son of Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhumah, asked the Prophet wasalam, if he should write down the statements of the Prophet wasalam, he said, write them down for by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing comes out of my tongue, out of my mouth, except that it is the truth. So therefore, the Prophet wasalam, speech is protected. So this idea that he became sick and delirious, we've taken care of that. Now comes the interpretation. Well, what does that mean? Well, he, he offered like five or six ways of interpreting the uh, the text that Omar radiallahu anhu uh, felt didn't want to overburden him, wanted us to rely on our HD head. Uh, and then we have that issue of Imam Ali at the end, so on and so forth. And then lastly, that there's another narration in which the Prophet says, okay, leave me, I am better, uh, and I'm leaving you uh, with with the book of Allah, inshallah. Okay, hopefully hopefully that's that's clear. One second, I want to look something up really quickly. That last hadith, I just wanted to see where it's narrated. And um, 1682. So he says that I in the Arabic version that he has previously mentioned this hadith. So let me just see what I have here. Uh, oh, that's actually the hadith in Bukhari. Okay, so that last part is one of the ex one of the completions of the hadith that's found in Bukhari. Okay. Um. Section 7, Study of Other Hadiths. People might ask about the import of the hadith narrated from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu in which he stated that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, O oh Allah, I am a man who becomes angry and men become angry. I have taken a contract with you that you will not break. Wherever I injure, curse, or flog a believer, make it an expiation for him and an act of drawing near which will bring him near to you on the day of rising. Narrated by Muslim. One variant says, who does not deserve it? And another version we find, whenever I curse, inveigh against, or flog a Muslim, make it purification, a prayer, and a mercy for him. How could it be correct for the Prophet, ﷺ, to curse someone who did not deserve to be cursed, or revile someone who did not deserve to be reviled, or flog someone who did not deserve to be flogged, or do other things out of anger, when he was protected from anything of that kind. By the wisdom which has already been mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ judged that people should be flogged or chastised by his curse or vilification according to the demands of their outward state. Then, because of his compassion for his community and his mercy and kindness for the believer by which Allah Ta'ala described him, and his being on guard lest Allah Ta'ala should accept his invocation against anyone he cursed, the Prophet ﷺ asked Allah to make him to make his curse and his action a mercy for that reason, for that person. This is what he meant by who does not deserve it. It was not that the Prophet ﷺ was moved by anger and provoked by displeasure, causing him to do something like this to the Muslim who did not deserve it. Okay, so that's a very beautiful you know, teaching. The Prophet ﷺ, as a judge, has to judge based on the apparent. So any any judge's job is to based on what's the on the apparent, the evidence that's in front of them. So so and so you know did something wrong. Okay, he needs to be punished. But after the judgment, in the act of punishing that person, the Prophet Sallam's heart leans towards that person, and felt sorry for the condition of that person. And because the Prophet ﷺ loved his companions so much and loved humanity so much, 
even when the punishment was being had, he asked Allah, make me giving, exacting out this punishment, a forgiveness for them and a mercy for them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our teachers tell us a story. I think that there, this was, you know, many centuries ago in Mecca, um, there was a, a descendant of the family of the Prophet وسلم, who was found, I think, drinking. So um, he was brought, you know, to the Qadi, and, and, and you know, he's, he's drinking, he doesn't give it up, so he has to be flogged uh, after being warned. So the Qadi said, okay, I will do it. So he took, you know, like a, a light type of stick or something, and uh, he, 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 he hit him once. And then after he, said, he hit him, he said, please forgive me, Yasidi, because he's a descendant of Rasulullah Sallallahu and then he hit him a second time. He said, please, for, he started crying. The judge is crying. Please forgive me, Yasidi. Your grandfather told me I have to do this. And, and every time he would lightly, you know, tap his back and flog him with that, he would ask him for his forgiveness by mentioning his grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the same kind of meaning, whereas the outward law is one thing and then the inward disposition is something else. This is the, continuing to the text. This is the correct meaning. It is not understood from his words, I am angry as men are angry. That anger moved him to do something that should not be done. It is possible that what is meant is that anger for Allah moved him to punish someone by his curse or vilification uh, when what they had done was something that could be tolerated and could be pardoned or something about which has been given the choice between punishment and pardon. It is possible that it came as com compassion and to teach his community fear and as a caution for those who exceeded the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is possible that what is related here about the Prophet's curse, alayhi salam, and his invocations against other people in other situations refers to what he said about deliberate intention, being rather Arab, uh, being rather Arab usage and not meant to be responded to, such as when he said, uh, may your right hand be dusty, Taribat yadak in the hadith of marriage. And may Allah Ta'ala not fill your belly. And may uh, she scratch and wound her face. That is, she is annoying and other things. Meaning, he's saying it could be just an expression. Allah. It is related in his biography in more than one place, that the Prophet ﷺ did not use bad language. And that's another thing, right? That's one of his khasa'is, one of his traits. In the Hilya, he says, مَا كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مُتَفَحِشَا He was not lewd and, and a vulgar man, ﷺ. He did not curse. That was not his normal, his normal disposition. ﷺ. Anas said, he did not vilify nor use bad language nor curse. He used to say to one of us whom he was censuring, what is wrong with him? May his brow be dusty. So in other words, if he saw somebody doing something that he didn't like, he wouldn't directly insult the person or call that person out, but he did it in a way and he would use expressions common at the time to, to be gentle in, in how he deals with it. So this, you know, this Western or modern, let's say not Western, but this modern way of, you know, I'm going to be very direct and transparent with you. You know, you're ugly. We, that's not the way, that's not how the Prophet does not talk. That's not how we talk with one another. So if you want to criticize somebody or you want to point something out, you got to do it in a nice way. You don't want to, you don't want to cut a person down and insult them, especially in public. Um, and this is something that requires work, all of us, because there are a lot of people who are just too, you know, too raw. Um, and this is, this is a sunnah that we should revive. Well, we have to revive all of the sunnahs. But I mean, let's start with this sunnah, is that when we deal with one another and we talk with one another, gotta be gentle. You know, this tough love thing is not always, uh, not always helpful, especially... If it's not like a child, like when you have a child, you got to teach them a lesson and, you know, 
you told them not to do something and they did it and, you, and then they're crying and they're upset. Well, you know, you got to face the music and dance. That's that's fine. But if somebody walks into the mosque and they're wearing something goofy or, or I don't know, something like that, or, um, you know, I don't know, like in my own, my own life, right? It's it's the weight thing. It's the, the weight and Arabs. You know, you, you go to your family in the Middle East for a break and they haven't seen you and they're like, oh my God, you've gained so much weight. I mean, you don't think I know that I've gained weight. You know, you don't have to point that out. Why is that the first thing you say after Salaam Alaikum? So stuff like that. It's just hurtful. I mean, it's so hurtful that I think this is now the second or third time I, I bring it up in my in the class. So um, it's it's it, you have to be gentle with people. This is how the Prophet ﷺ was when he talked. This was, com returning to the text, this was compassion and kindness for whoever he had cursed so that there would not be any fear about the curse of the Prophet ﷺ and so that the fact of uh, having been cursed by him would not lead to a person to despair. So here we're talking about the Prophet ﷺ having mercy and love for the person who has done something wrong and is uh, the punishment is being uh, acted out or enacted against that person. So out of his love and mercy for that criminal, the Prophet ﷺ does not want this person to think that because he as Rasulullah ﷺ is punishing him or cursing him or whatever, that he, he doesn't want that person to despair. I mean, this is really the ultimate, the pinnacle of the Prophet's mercy and humanity, sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. It could also be a request from him to his Lord for someone who he had flogged or cursed justly and correctly, asking him, Allah Ta'ala, to make it an act of expiation for that person, for what he had done and to efface what he had committed. His punishment in his in this Allah's punishment in this world would then be the cause of his pardon and forgiveness, meaning in the hereafter. It has come in another hadith, whoever does something and is punished for it in this world, it is an expiation for him. People might ask about the meaning of the hadith of a Zubair and the statement of the Prophet ﷺ to him when he was arguing with an Ansari about the stream. Take water, Zubair, until the water reaches ankle depth. The Ansari said to him, Is he your nephew then, Messenger of Allah? The face of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ changed color. And he said, Take water, Zubair, until it reaches wall height. The answer is that the Prophet ﷺ can clearly be absolved from doing anything which a Muslim might have reason to find doubt, doubtful, in which a Muslim might have reason to find doubtful in respect to the story. The Prophet ﷺ's first recommendation that as Zubair restrict himself to a portion of his just rights by following the middle way in order to be conciliatory, when the other man was not pleased with what with that and insisted and said that should not be said, the Prophet ﷺ gave Zubair his full right. So the Ansari kind of said an insulting thing to the Prophet ﷺ, and he's saying, oh, and you're just saying that because he's your nephew, like he's your, your relative. So then the Prophet ﷺ is, you know, said, okay, Zubair, take all of your rights, forget this middle, middle path. This is why Al-Bukhari dealt with this hadith in the chapter concerning when the Imam counsels conciliation and peace and the one judged against refuses the judgment. Uh, Imam Al-Bukhari, by the way, Sahih Al-Bukhari is, is um, a really, uh, it's like almost like a magical book, right? Uh, it, it's a great, it's, a, it's an unbelievable book. One of the beauties, one of the joys of reading that book, Sahih Al-Bukhari, is reading the titles that Imam al-Bukhari gives to the sections. And there's a whole uh, sub-study in, in that. Like, why did Imam al-Bukhari, like, he'll, like, narrate one hadith, and then he'll give that, that hadith a title, like, he'll, he'll put it in a section, and at first glance, the title of the section has absolutely nothing to do with the hadith. So you're, like, scratching your head, like, what, is, what is that? What does this hadith have to do with that? So you start asking yourself, what, what is the relationship between the two? Anyway, so it, not all of the books of hadith are like that. This is, this is a unique feature of Bukhari. Not exactly. I mean, they all have titles to sections, but Imam al-Bukhari has these very <laughs> elaborate titles. So Imam al-Bukhari read this hadith, and he said, oh, you know what this hadith is for? 
This is hadith is for when the imam or, or the leader is reconciling between two people, gives a judgment, and the one party who the judgment is against doesn't like the result. Now, in a normal situation, if I'm a judge and there's A and B, and I judge for B, and A gets mad, you like, you know, tough luck, tough, tough luck. I mean, that's the judgment. So here, that's not what the Prophet ﷺ did. The Prophet ﷺ re-adjudicated the case. But obviously, <laughs> further against the, the, the person who was upset in the first time. So let me just repeat that. This is why Al-Bukhari dealt with this hadith in the chapter concerning when the imam, the imam here in the in the literature of the sharia, the imam means the political leader. When the imam uh, counsels conciliation and peace and the one judge against refuses the judgment. He mentioned at the end of the hadith, so the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa gave Zubair his full rights. Yani the Prophet ﷺ is telling the Ansar, oh, you don't like my judgment? Okay, Zubair, take all of your rights. I was trying to find a just way in the middle, uh, to find the middle path. Oh, you don't like it? Khalas, Zubair, take all of your rights. Okay, that's sort of like any, how, it's, how it's happening. The Muslims use this hadith as a basis, a basis, basis for judgment in such cases. The Prophet ﷺ is followed in all that he did, whether he was in a state of anger or pleasure. Because the Prophet's anger does not overcome him. He becomes angry, like, I mean, you know, uh, like anybody. If you don't become, Imam al Ghazali says, if you don't become angry, something's wrong with you. So becoming anger, it's like, it's like saying, um, it's almost like saying, I, I never need to go to the bathroom. I mean, you're not human. I mean, every human ha at some point has got to go to the bathroom. So it's just a normal thing. It's acting out on that anger that's a problem. And by the way, since we're, it's kind of related to this, one of the things that when you read about the literature of, of the Mufti, which is obviously a, a topic that's important to me, uh, there are states that the Mufti should not issue a ruling, or there are states in which a judge should not issue a ruling. And one of those states is when they're angry, or sleepy, or hungry, or need to use the bathroom. Um, extreme heat, extreme cold, right? Because that can affect a normal person. That that will affect, you know, if, if I had to, if I was a judge and I had to use the bathroom really bad, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, whatever. What you know, you're just going to rush through the thing, so you can't. You have to time out, go to the bathroom, relieve yourself, freshen up, come back, and then and then do it. So for a normal person, we th th those are part of the etiquette. But in the case of the Prophet Sallam, in both his anger and pleasure, we take what he said, Alayhi Sallam. Although a judge is oh, subhanallah, although a judge is forbidden to give a decision when he is angry, the Prophet ﷺ is the same in either anger or pleasure, since he was protected in his anger. The Prophet's anger, Alaihissalam, was for Allah, not for himself, as we know from the second hadith. The same thing applies to the hadith about his giving okasha retaliation against himself when the action was not intentional or provoked by anger. Okasha told him, radiallahu anhu, "You hit me with the stick." And I do not know whether it was intentional or whether you meant to hit the camel. The Prophet ﷺ said, seek refuge with Allah Akasha from thinking that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ would do that intentionally. A similar case can be found in another hadith when the Prophet ﷺ offered a Bedouin retaliation. The man said, I have forgiven you. The Prophet ﷺ had struck him with a whip since he kept hanging on the rein of the she camel. The Prophet ﷺ told him to stop and said, you will not get what you deserve. You will get what you deserve. The man refused, so the third time he struck him. When the Prophet ﷺ did in his case was to correct someone who did not stop when he was told to. It was a matter of adab, of etiquette. But he was apprehensive since the man had a right in the matter until he had received his pardon. As for the hadith of Sawad ibn Amr, I came to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and I had some khaluq perfume on, a yellow dye with a scent. He cried out, waters, waters, get back, get back. He pushed me in the stomach with a stick he was holding and hurt me. I cried out retaliation and he uncovered his stomach for me. So in this story, the, the, the 
the the the scent was off putting or the color was off putting so the prophet doesn't pull them away so the man said oh i want my qisas you know i want retaliation you hurt you you hit me i get to hit you so the prophet sallam exposed his stomach and then the man kissed the prophet's stomach sallallahu alaihi wa sallam the Prophet ﷺ struck him because he saw something objectionable in him. Perhaps he did not mean to hit him with a stick except to make him take note. When there was pain from it, which he had not intended, he sought to absolve himself from it in the way that he had, we have already mentioned. Allahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam wa sallallahu ma'ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Any questions? Okay.